Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. And this is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. It's the afternoon of Friday the 13th, 2015. Friday the 13th of March, 2015, that is. And uh, things are getting... Uh, more and more dangerous as as we go along, as we'll try to uh, try to show. So uh, the question now is the forty seven traitors, the forty seven traitors of the Republican Party. We have now entered into a major constitutional crisis, yet another one in the U.S. And we have been talking to you about the perspective. Let's put it all in perspective before we even get to the, to the details. We have two bankrupt parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. And the question is, how do we reform this system? Well, of course, we do it programmatically with programmatic ideas, the Wall Street sales tax, the seizing of the Fed to finance a recovery. We need to have an organization. It's getting to be the Tax Wall Street Party and the United Front Against Austerity. We're developing a cadre of leaders who can actually take on this job. But you've also got to have a strategy. And the strategy has a number of elements, right? Don't support austerity measures is number one. But then there's this also this question How do you deal with these two existing parties? And we've always been very clear. The Republican Party needs to be eliminated first. And the reason for this is, well, the the simplest reason, if you eliminate the Democratic Party first, you're left with the Republicans who would then proceed to institute a fascist dictatorship from which it would be almost impossible to exit. Indeed, The continuing existence of the Republican Party brings with it the threat that if they should ever get the White House, in addition to the Congress, which they now have, in addition to the Supreme Court, which they will have unless and until somebody on there is impeached, Scalia being the most obvious target, impeach Scalia. But if the Republicans ever get control of all of those, they will then proceed to institute, once again, a fascist austerity dictatorship. It will be a permanent fascist austerity dictatorship, and it will be, it will come complete with the denial of the vote, the limitation of the franchise. Remember, Scalia says that there is no right to vote under the U.S. Constitution. Isn't that something? You don't have the right to vote says Scalia, and he's been sitting there for 30 years, and nobody's laid a glove on him. Uh, And not only the right to vote, if you're black, Hispanic, young, poor, whatever it is, Democrat, anything like that, and then also the destruction of unions. (laughs) And that's not hypothetical or theoretical. In this past week, the fascist Walker, a presidential contender, thanks to the Koch billions This is getting to look like Krupp and Tursen and Ops and the other uh, smokestack barons and bankers who uh, supported Hitler and Prescott Bush, of course, among them, Harriman, Henry Ford, the Dulles brothers, but so forth. Uh, Right now we have Walker up there. The danger is that in addition to having the limitation of the franchise, which is already going forward, even Obama referred to it in Selma last weekend, you've also got the attempted destruction of the unions. Uh, And if you do all that, you will have a permanent austerity dictatorship. So it's important to eliminate the Republican Party first. After that, you can proceed, and, and really this would happen almost physiologically, the Democratic Party would tend to split into two camps, the majority Wall Street Democrats, we've gone through before who they are, you know who they are, and on the other hand, the minority, that would be the New Deal, pro-labor, actual populists. Today, 
somebody like Elizabeth Warren can pretend to be a leader of that group. But of course, she has absolutely no programmatic content. What does she stand for? She doesn't like Wall Street banks. What does that mean? She won't invite them to the state dinners at the White House. Doesn't mean anything. We want to see program, not vague generalities, not gestures or symbolic actions, but mass traction economic demands key to the survival needs of working families here in the United States right now today. Not campaign finance reform, not GMO foods, not the Securities and Exchange Commission budget, but mass traction economic demands, stop foreclosures, free college, uh, refinance student debt at zero percent, Raise the minimum wage, and above all, the biggest of all, 30 million new productive jobs, permanent ones, and 10 million new entry-level uh, jobs. So that's why we want the Republican Party eliminated first. We're against the entire system, but if you try to do it getting rid of the Democrats first, you will be caught by a fascist dictatorship halfway through the process. By eliminating the Republicans first, you make that fascist dictatorship less likely, uh, and you can then proceed to have the Democratic Party divide, which, it, well, again, which would be almost uh, spontaneous uh, in that uh, case, right? You can see it right now. The people who are supporting Hillary Clinton and those uh, who are not, that's sort of the, uh, the breakdown. You can see that quite clearly. Now, the relevance of this has been the following. Uh, the Republicans are the more dangerous group at the moment. There's no doubt. Uh, the Republic, the Democratic Party under Obama is, ironically, the lesser evil. And this is becoming uh, more and more clear, even to foreign observers, right? People who thought that Obama was the warmonger in chief. Well, of course, that's, uh, that's a very one-sided, that's a crude distortion. Obama turns out to be the lesser evil compared to some of these warmongers who are running around. But now specifically... The Republicans, as the party of national sabotage, have attempted to bankrupt the United States with a default, right? And that gave the pretext to these predatory lending agencies to downgrade the U.S. debt. We've had uh, one shutdown, two shutdowns of the entire government under Republicano fascist auspices. We've got the sequester. We're hearing the Pentagon screaming about sequester. More important for us, the National Institutes of Health and research into dread diseases. That has been crippled by this idiotic sequester. And most recently, we had the uh, attempt by the Republicans to use, hold hostage the funding of the Department of, uh, of Homeland Security to their xenophobic, racist, anti-foreigner program. And, and it's wrong on both sides. The immigrants are necessary to build a labor force capable of competing with China. They are the vital raw material that needs to be developed, educated, fostered, made prosperous in order to compete with these quite formidable foreign uh, opponents. And on the other side, the Republicans with that would have had a close brush with extinction. In other words, the Republicans are lurching along the ragged edge of extinction. Again, if they shut down Homeland Security and a major terrorist event uh, erupts, they would be blamed. They would be on the road to extinction. And I, ironically, I don't, I don't wish for such a thing, but if you do the calculus, you'll probably see that um, something like that might be less catastrophic for the world than a Republican president going to thermonuclear war with Russia over... Ukraine, defending a bunch of fascists in Ukraine. So that's not good stuff. So the, the Republican Party had one brush with extinction with this DHS where they pulled back. And now their second brush comes over the 47 traitors. We've had the 12 tyrants. Now we've got the 47 traitors. Put a hashtag, Diasis, a sharp in front of that. And you've got a, uh, a very interesting program. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Let me uh, invite anybody in the New York City area, if you've got time on Saturday afternoon. The protests are moving to Brooklyn. 
And this is uh, Saturday the 14th, the first day that this program is available. Uh, I'm not sure if you're hearing it now, you're going to have any time to get down there, but you might as well know about it. Saturday the 14th of March from 1 to 4 p.m. at 625 Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn at a uh, an appliance store there. 625 Atlantic Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. So uh, what we're hoping for is that this small demonstration project that, that goes on from week to week, where are the big organizations? Where's Al Sharpton? Where's Jesse Jackson? Where are the reporters from MSNBC? Where's Chris Hayes, Rachel Maddow, uh, that guy uh, O'Donnell who comes on uh, late at night? Get involved, people. This is where it's at. This is the number one political prisoner, Reverend Edward Pinckney. And we're always... Uh, at his service, whenever he can get through to us, uh, you can hear him right here on on World Crisis Radio. So, uh, the constitutional crisis after the default, almost, the shutdowns, two of them, the sequester, it's a killer, the DHS debacle, the, the xenophobic fascistoid program, right, driving away precisely the people you're going to need to compete in the 21st century. And then, of course, the Netanyahu appearance, right? The insolence and the impudence. I would have recommended that the, and did recommend that the United States pull back the ambassador from Tel Aviv and uh, have consultations as a, sim uh, a symbol, uh, a symptom of the uh, extreme uh, irritation that the is Netanyahu is committing unfriendly acts unfriendly acts. That's a loaded diplomatic term. Because what BB is preaching, BB is, is saying, there's going to be a war with Iran. Either you, U.S., attack them, or I, Netanyahu, will attack them. So he's essentially trying to drag the American people into war. There would have been time when that would have led to a diplomatic furor, right? There were such attacks on foreign leaders in the past. But we've got the party of the foreigner, <laughs> the Republican Party, the party of tax evaders, the party of Chinese speculators, the party, of course, of the Koch brothers. Uh, they, they're the ones who provide a lot of the oomph. But we don't really know who owns the Republicans, right? Thanks to their, Scalia's, Citizens United. One of the effects of Citizens United is you don't know what foreigner owns your government. That can be the British, British banks, the people who got bailed out by the Fed. Maybe that's why they got bailed out by the Fed. We simply do not know. So the point is, impeach Scalia and down with the 47 traders. Now, you know this letter, right? This is Tom Cotton. We, we noticed that Tom Cotton came up s sort of paired with um, Ben Sass in Nebraska the idea here, of course, being uh, if we look back to other exercises of this type. We know that uh, Jimmy Carter, when the trilaterals brought up Jimmy Carter, they had a spare. That was Reuben Askew, governor of Florida. So we could say that Askew was the spare Carter. We had thought that Cotton was the spare Sass, but now Sass may be the spare Cotton. Right? Cotton shows himself to be uh, a fanatical, reckless uh, leader, uh, kamikaze chief, uh, and he has now focused attention on himself in this way, right? So that's the Republican Party. The Republican Party is now spawning kamikaze lunatics of the caliber of cotton. Uh, so the idea being they write to the Iranian government in very crude terms and say, guess what? Any deal you make, we will sabotage. The Congress can sabotage it, and a future Republican president will sabotage it, meaning war. So there's another good reason not to have a Republican president. And it's a good reason to get somebody that's not Hillary Clinton to be the nominee, because, of course, Hillary Clinton can hardly say, you're a warmonger and I represent peace, because she doesn't. She's a neocon warmonger. And she's got that woman complex going where she's got to be the biggest warmonger in the room. Otherwise, she feels 
insecure, and she joins hands with uh, with Jeb Bush. So this all terrible. So the point is the 47 traders have now said that a peaceful solution is impossible. Now, we just want to follow this a little bit more. <clears throat> um, the idea of this now is, uh, since we, we have to note in passing, that most international agreements are not treaties, right? The treaties that have been ratified with some public attention in recent decades, you know, the NATO treaty in the late 40s was, of course, one. The certain arms control treaties of the 80s, even into the 90s, were of some importance. NATO expansion um, was, I guess, ratified by the Senate, but uh, without much public attention. In other words, the Eastern Europeans came in under, uh, under Clinton, and then the Baltics came in under Mad Dog Bush the younger. But suppose now uh, you look at the what, two-thirds of uh, international accords that are in the form of executive agreements. Now, first thing is, if the 47 traders block U.S. diplomacy, it means you can't have a peaceful solution to anything. Anything. Because you can't get it through the Senate. It's clear. They're going to sabotage it. You can't do it as a treaty. You'd like to do it as an executive agreement, and they're telling you, no, we're going to overthrow it. Now, anybody ought to be able to see, if you make a peaceful solution impossible, you're choosing war. If you can't make peace, you're going to get war. The only way to prevent some of these disputes from ballooning into needless wars, including needless world wars, is to be able to get things done and get them approved. Case in point. Uh, when in late uh, summer 1940, the British found that they were going to go under as a result of submarine attacks in the North Atlantic by the German U-boats, they turned to Franklin D. Roosevelt and said, look, we need destroyers. We need anti-submarine warfare. The British, of course, had been building battleships because they thought they'd dominate the world that way. They didn't want to build anti-submarine warfare. <laughs> How interesting. It backfired on them. But Roosevelt was not going to make a debater's point. He had to save the British from going under as a result of their own folly. So here we get the destroyers for bases deal. 50 World War I destroyers plus 20 Coast Guard cutters of a more modern type were given over to the Royal Navy of Great Britain to, uh, to prevent the Britain from going under. The U.S. in exchange got bases all around the British Caribbean to defend the Panama Canal. That was an executive agreement. And that's how it has to be done sometimes when it's got to be quick. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Make sure you keep up with Tarpley.net. Tarpley.net, it's all there, including Webster G. Tarpley Twitter service. And that Twitter service is, uh, I think... Um, Absolutely essential because you got to keep up with things at least day by day and hour by hour is better. So uh, conceptual framework in this Friday broadcast and related articles, but uh, at the same time, get it on toplead.net. I did two, two uh, commentaries for Press TV of Iran this week. Uh, we have at least one of them to post, so uh, I hope that will prove uh, possible. Check it out on tarpley.net. Now, concerning the 47 traders, the first thing is, if you can't make a peace deal, then the result is likely to be war. How about this one? If 75, two-thirds or three-quarters of the U.S. international agreements are in the form of executive agreements, this 47 traders letter essentially says we're going to overthrow all of those. We're going to go through them, and we're going to smash up the ones we don't like. That is chaos, international anarchy. We've seen how the Republican Party of sabotage attacks civilization as we've achieved it, defaults, government shutdowns, sequesters, shut down the police, open the door to God knows what, mayhem, right? There are enemies out there, right? There, there are false flags, but there are also real enemies. So uh, that's uh, what they essentially... Uh, want to do. Uh, and uh, this, this, of course, it, it, it's essentially the destruction of, of government. So we've had domestic 
anarchy from the Republican Party of Sabotage. And now to that, they are adding international anarchy, international chaos, because the U.S. alliance system is the bedrock of the international reality for much of the world. Not all, but much of the world, right? Europe, Japan, Oceania, all these places. Okay. Now, also, the other thing is how stupid they are, right? I have to laugh at this. If I'm an Iranian hardliner, I can now say, <laughs> well, uh, I'm off the hook because I can, I can sabotage this thing, and I know that the U.S. will be blamed. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Uh, it's what they deserve, right, because of their stupidity. This, the, these are the Mayberry Machiavellis, right, the, the redneck uh, diplomats. Um, it's ridiculous. So uh, you're essentially, it's an engraved invitation to any, engra any Iranian hardliner that wants to raise his head to say, we can sabotage this. And again, if you don't get a deal, it makes war more likely. This is a bad thing. You want to have a deal. We want to finesse, paper over, solve, get this off the screen, get it off the table, and try to move on to something more, more realistic. Uh, now, the other one is, how about the other powers, right? Because these Republicans persist in regarding this, as Netanyahu presented it, as something that's just between the U.S. and Iran. Wait a minute. There are some important pieces of territory that somehow don't uh, fit in with this, right? There's some place called Russia, China, and then, you know, the British, uh, France, uh, Germany, countries of some note. You ought to take a look at them there, cotton. So there are these places, and they're part of the negotiation too. So whatever is forthcoming, if anything is at this point, after all the sabotage, that will be with... The the imprimatur of the five permanent members of the Security Council, plus Germany, well, that's going to go right through the UN Security Council, and the Republicans are going to be left isolated in the world with their insane, anarchistic, Koch-inspired lunacy. I think one of the reasons they do crazy things is because they're living on Koch money. They don't really feel that they have to uh, appeal to a broader part of the electorate, as indeed they cannot. So they essentially say, well, if this is what Koch likes, run it by Koch, and if so, then if Koch likes it, then, then we're, we're going to do it. Now, uh, since this uh, is obvious to the others, right, um, China, Russia, Britain, France, Germany, uh, suppose this all fails, the sanctions regime is going to fall apart. Now, that I, I would certainly welcome I'm against economic warfare in all of its forms. Take a look at my book, Surviving the Cataclysm, 1999, second edition, 2009. Take a look in there and you'll see I call for the ending of all embargoes, economic warfare, sanctions. Sometimes it can be applied. They can be applied to military goods, especially exotic weapons and so forth. But other than that, all the normal stuff. Uh, any other kind of civilian product, and don't tell me about dual use. Uh, these these should not be uh, allowed to persist, and they won't persist because now that the U.S. forty-seven traders have shot their mouths off, forty-seven bunglers, forty-seven anarchists, whatever they are, they've now made themselves a laughing stock. But now anybody can say, "Look, it's impossible to work with the U.S. They have this lunatic majority now in the in the Congress." And uh, it just won't work. Now, some of the Republicans are getting uh, scared <laughs> what they've done, because this is probably, you know, one of five different pieces of idiotic sabotage they do on any given day. And uh, the Republicans, some of them are trying to say that, oh, well, <laughs> you know, you win a few, you lose a few. That's that's McCain, right? McCain says, well, well uh, maybe this wasn't exactly the best way to carry this out, right? Maybe that's, that's uh, you know, something uh, rather foolish <laughs> that we've done. Yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously so. So you imagine if, if McCain started World War III, I can imagine a cartoon of McCain, you know, the missiles are going to come down, the missiles are going up and the other missiles are going to come down, and McCain is there saying, whoops, uh, that wasn't the right way to do it, huh? 
Here it is. Maybe that wasn't exactly the best way to do that, says McCain to Fox News on Tuesday, taken up again in the editorial of The New York Times yesterday, the 12th of uh, March, as I believe. Whoops. Now there's also the fraternity prank. I would uh, uh, suggest that you go to the writings of Nietzsche on the blonde beast, the blonde beast, and how uh, for the blonde beast, this was George Bush the Younger, certainly, uh, to kill people can be seen as a fraternity prank, ein Studentenstreich, in the words of Nietzsche. Right? Fraternity prank. Ah, you kill a few people. It's just boys will be boys. So in this frame of mind, we have, uh, I think it's uh, the Daily Beast. Uh, the Times of Israel, anyway, has a good synthesis. The Times of Israel says that there are certain Republican Senate aides who are trying to laugh it off. Quote, two Republican congressional aides in an article published Tuesday described the 47 traders uh, letter as cheeky, while others said that the note was a lighthearted attempt at asserting congressional power vis-a-vis the high stakes talks over a nuclear agreement with Iran. The administration, one of them says, the administration has no sense of humor when it comes to how weakly they have been handling these negotiations, said a senior Republican aide. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, this humor is apparently lost on most capitals in the world who somehow don't start laughing as they contemplate a war in the Middle East. And how about your kids? Do you have children, grandchildren? Are they supposed to have a life under these lunatics? The Republicans have got to go. And uh, one in particular, uh, the one who maybe dupes uh, more people that might eventually come into this uh Uh, broadcast (laughs) that would be little Rand Paul we'll get him in just a minute welcome back to World Crisis Radio now uh, the American people are amused either by the World War 3 clowning of the 47 traders again if you don't have a peace deal the chances of a general Middle East war increase and That's bad. And you don't know how far that will go. Remember uh, Louise uh, and Marie Slaughter of the uh, State Department and Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton has said, yeah, you want to bomb Syria because that's a place where you can defeat Putin, right? You can kill some Russians and, and humiliate Putin that way. This is absolute insanity. You're dealing, you're playing Russian roulette with a terrible, terrible situation. So uh, <laughs> we're not amused. Now, how, how, how is this expressed? First of all, there is a petition at the White House site uh, which wants the prosecution of the 47 traitors for, you name it, high treason. How about that? I think you could make a pretty good case. Giving aid and comfort to enemies. This is an overt act. The enemies are not the usual ones, but uh, I'm sure we can identify them. And the other one is the Logan Act of 1799. In other words, that this Senate is usurping the power of the executive branch, and they are masquerading as the current State Department when they're talking about a future one. So more than 200,000, and the Obama regime will have to answer, even though I'm sure they'll answer in some mumbling, namby-pamby way. If Eric Holder is such a fire eater, I want to see Eric Holder, who is now leaving, he has nothing to lose, indict a couple of those senators. Indict Cotton. Indict Cotton and put the fear of God into these people. Right? They are subversives. A lot of them are uh, susceptible to prosecution under the Smith Act. A lot of them have violated the – they have advocated the violent overthrow of the U.S. government, like the hog castrator there, Joni from, uh, from Iowa. But then we have the voice of New York City, and this is, a, this is a day to remember, a week to remember. The New York Daily News <laughs> – <laughs> the the uh, it's a tabloid, of course. It's it's actually the largest tabloid in the U.S. It's the fifth largest newspaper. The other ones are all things like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and uh, USA Today, 
and so forth, and I think Los Angeles Times, who are bigger. This is the biggest tabloid. It's, it's still more than half a million copies a day. And the headline is, traitors! Yes, indeed, traitors! GOPers try to sabotage BAM nuke deal. Now, BAM, of course, for, for the uh, people not familiar with the ways of the Big Apple, the BAM is Obama, right? Hill was Hillary, BAM is Obama, so they're trying to sabotage BAM. And who do we have? We have the face of Mitch McConnell, always always horrendous, Schrecklichkeit. We have Ted Cruz, we have Tom Cotton, and we have little Rand Paul. They're sending a warning letter to Iran. They say the pact may be overturned, and the Dems are saying stunt risks a war. And that is the honest truth. This stunt does risk war. Again, for the simple reason that if you can't make a peace deal, you're at the uh, mercy of whatever winds may drive you in the direction of war. So um, <laughs> when, when the Europeans complained to McCain, he said, I don't care about you. You're a bunch of Neville Chamberlains. <laughs> in other words, you're not a crazed warmonger like John McCain, right, who Starts a war and then says, oh, that maybe that wasn't the best way to do it. Whoops. Or Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham. He says, I don't care what Germany wants. They're not standing up to Putin. <laughs> they haven't started such a situation. Now, we're, what we're seeing is a cultural crisis of the U.S. Uh, elite. I would also point out that uh, Lindsey Graham and, and Netanyahu are getting a lot of play here in Washington. Maybe you don't know it out there in the uh, in, in the rest of the world, but here in Washington there has been a huge advertising campaign by. Let's see if I'm going to remember the organization. I, I doubt that I will. Maybe later on in the show. But <laughs> what you see, it's called the delivery, right? And it looks like some kind of a, a truck, you know, sort of uh, subcontracting for. Uh, DHL or uh, FedEx or whatever it is, is a white, a white van, and it's coming through the streets of Washington and uh, stops for a pedestrian, uh, almost gets into trouble with that, and it drives into a parking garage, and it's parked out on the roof in the middle of Washington, D.C., and we've been hearing Lindsey Graham warning, and then Netanyahu intoning his warning, and then the nuclear bomb goes off. So it's the sum of all fears translated into uh, Washington, D.C., uh, with the help of uh, Netanyahu and, and uh, Lindsey Graham. So this hysterical propaganda, right? Absolute fear-mongering, absolute insanity. So uh, what's the remedy? Now, look, uh, we got to delve a little bit into history. We do have a history here in, in the United States. It is not kind to those who are branded as traitors. You have to remember, in the War of 1812, 200 years ago, we had the Federalist Party, and the Federalist Party had this at this point degenerated. Right? It doesn't help. It didn't help the Federalists of 1814 that they'd been founded by Washington, run by Hamilton, and then by, by Adams. No. Uh, that's why it won't help the Republicans that they can count Abraham Lincoln and such, uh, such people won't help them because they have now degenerated, right? Lincoln is long gone. The Republicans have, have flipped over, uh, completely. And the point is then, if we go back to 1814, there was the war of 1812, right? The British had burned, uh, the Washington, they had attacked, uh, Baltimore, and been driven off. But by December of 1814, just about 150 years ago, uh, quite recently, they were uh, attacking the U.S. And the, the New England Federalists decided that they would break out of this, that they would, ha they would start making their own foreign policy, huh? Their own foreign policy. Uh, let's see what we get. Uh, during the dark days of 1814, commercial New England's loyalty to the Union was put to a severe test. Uh, there were British attacks and so forth. The legislature of Massachusetts, Federalists, voted to call a convention to meet at Hartford, Connecticut, for the purpose of giving voice to New England opinion. 
meaning treason and secessionism. The convention met on December 15th. They did reject narrowly a plan that savored of secessionism, but they condemned the multi multiplied abuses of past administrations and acts of Congress in violation of the Constitution. Isn't it amazing that when secessionism and treason come, it wraps itself, they wrap themselves in the Constitution. The Hartford Convention maintained the right and duty of a state to interpose its authority in cases of deliberate, dangerous, and palpable infractions of the Constitution uh, but uh, don't overdo it. You can't fly into open rebellion on every single one. Now, the war ended. Prosperity returned to New England. The proponents of the Hartford Convention soon became eager to forget what they had done, Republicans. But since the convention had been primarily the work of Federalists, the Republicans, meaning the other party, were able, not the Republicans of today, the Democratic Republic, sort of the Jeffersons, right, the Democrats, were able to charge the party of Washington and Adams with treason and virtually to force it from the political scene. The Federalist Party was destroyed as a result of treason expressed in the Hartford Convention. And I uh, haven't done an exhaustive check, but I would say that's certainly one of the leading examples of what happens in American politics when you become the party of treason and the party of sabotage. So it is the duty of every right-thinking person anywhere you are in the world to help the Republican Party down this path to its ultimate extinction and uh, liquidation. And then we'll get on with uh, splitting the Democrats. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Reverend Pinky, welcome. Hey, Webster, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be on your show. I'm, I'm excited today. I, I tell you, I, I've been doing some work, my own work, and getting everything done. And, 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 and Webster, I just want to say that, you know, that we're moving forward and we're going to fight this monster and defeat this monster. We go back to court April the 14th, and we got to be ready because that jury incident or is, is, is so big. But I, I, I can't see them ruling in our favor on that note. Uh, I, I don't believe that that's going to happen because it'll be too much like right. And you're dealing with a system that that's consists of a criminal enterprise, and it's been running this way for years. So why would they change all of a sudden? I don't see it. And but we're going to continue to fight and look forward to the appeal court when I get a chance to uh, get this appeal bond and be ready to roll. Reverend, you are certainly right that when you're dealing with this extremely corrupt system of U.S. justice, so-called in general, and then this company town aspect of Whirlpool in uh, southwest Michigan, Berrien County, Benton Harbor, St. Joseph. It's, I think, best to uh, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And that also means emotionally. But uh, oh, oh, your absolutely. supporters are at work. Absolutely. And you know, the, the biggest thing is that I can, you know, I can handle it emotionally and my wife Dorothy can handle it emotionally. And, you know, I, I just want to give a shout out to her too also because she has been doing a tremendous job. I mean, I mean, I am, I am shocked at, you know, all the stuff that she's been doing and, and, and she's continued to go forward and, and she has not even stopped for a moment because she understands what we have against. Anytime that you're dealing with a system that's built on corruption, and getting away with it, then you know you got a problem. Even let me let me talk a little bit about this this prison system here. Go right ahead. They got the food here. They got Airmark. Airmark is a a, a a big company. It's a, a maybe fifteen to twenty billion dollars. Uh, what they gross every year. They have the the food that they serve these prisoners. It is it, it, you wouldn't even serve it to a dog. That's how bad it is. And we do have dogs here, too. But you wouldn't serve it to a dog. That's how bad the food is. And, and, the, and the health care. What they try to do here is the biggest money-making thing that I've ever seen in my life. You got the Bush family. You got all these, all these guys, uh, the ex-president. They got stock in this stuff. And, they, and they've been shooting for this stuff. And they're controlling this thing, the transportation. See, I call it the transportation travel, uh, uh, travel board because what they do, they torture you when they take you all across the country. And, and, and that's what they've been doing. But even though they convicted me with that lynch mob, I am still going to win. 
we are going to win. When I win, it's going to be it's going to be for the people. It's not for be. It's not going to be for Reverend Payne. It's going to be for the people because that's what I'm fighting for and that's what I stand for. Absolutely, Reverend. I guess what you're what you're seeing and reporting on to us is this prison industrial complex and this question of mass incarceration, right? Which sets the United States. Uh, apart, right? We have American exceptionalism, and it's all negative, right? It's all bad. The oh, highest absolutely. percentage of incarceration of anybody, and the black right. community even worse. It, absolutely, and here's the thing. We're getting close to 3 million now. You know, they said 2.3. They said that at one time, but that was that was almost five years ago. We're getting close to 3 million people in prison, more than China, who has a billion people, and they say that that's, that's uh, 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 they have violated so many people's human rights. This country has violated people's human rights like nothing before. We got guys here where I'm at right now that has been here over 50 years. And nobody ever say anything about these guys. These guys, some guys, if you're 70 years old, 75 years old, you're not going to commit another crime. You're not going to do whatever they, you know, they should be going home. We got a lot of senior citizens here who need to be going home, but the world is so intimidated and afraid because the news media say that if you let them out, they're going to come and kill your children and your wife. That's what they tell people, and that's what they put the fear into the people. But i got to tell you one thing. Even though I'm here, and I know I should be here, even though I was convicted by this lynch mob, I am not mad. We get an opportunity to show the world how corrupt this system is. And like I said, they running a criminal enterprise, and we have to let people know exactly what they're doing until we let them know they're going to continue being just like this. They're going to continue allowing these people, putting them in jail, and not ever letting them out. When If, if, if they say the poor boy say you do three years, you do three years. But here, they might give you a flop, give you 24 additional months, give you 12 additional months. But we, if, if, until the people understand how important it is, it's going to continue just this way. Now, Reverend, we want to we want to call on everybody. All the listeners to this program should uh, should help you, and this includes by funding and by volunteering and doing other things. I guess the the most essential is to go to bhbanco.org, right? B H Benton Harbor, and then B A N C O, bhbanco.org, and there's a PayPal on the right hand side. A little bit to scroll down a little bit, you'll see the PayPal on the right hand side. Make a generous contribution to, to the cause of Reverend Pinkney. Please make one call. We, we need the funds in order to win this battle. That's how they defeat us, because they know that we don't have the resources to fight back. And, and they've been doing the same thing over and over and over again, because they know once you get locked up, you have a limited amount of resources, because i got to make sure I take care of my home first. Then I got to worry about my legal defense fund. I got to worry about my lawyers. I got to worry about all these different things. But I, look, I'm here today, but that don't mean that uh, uh, I won't get out tomorrow. You out today, but that don't mean you may not be in here. So let's fight together and win this battle. We have to say enough is enough. We have to say, listen, we're going to win this battle and we're going to stop this criminal enterprise. That's the word we want to tell people. This criminal inter- enterprise is spreading all over this country, and they're and they doing it so they can make the rich richer and the poor poor. It's to have, it's to have not. And that's the way it's supposed to be set up for them, but not for us. So we have to show them what we're capable of doing. And i tell you this, this uh, uh, Webster, I am so excited to be able to tell the world about this because I know that this show goes all over, all over the world, not just uh, here in, 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 in this country. It goes everywhere. And we need to let people know exactly what is going on and what we need to do. But listen. I do. We do need funds. So whatever you can contribute, we'll be more than happy to receive. And believe me, everybody can take part in this. Everybody. Everybody can do something. And also, you can write me a letter. Go to BH Banco. It has the address where I'm at. Write me. Write me. Talk to me. And I promise you, I'll write you back. That's how I'll do that. So we must continue this fight and continue fighting this battle. And the best part about it, I know we're going to win this battle. There's no ill hands and buts about it. Reverend, I just want to pick up one of your points. We've gotten an, an authoritative legal opinion from an experienced attorney that this case is so rotten and so flawed on the legal uh, level that the only hope of these persecutors and prosecutors is uh, war of attrition, to grind us down, grind you down, 
uh, exhaust our resources and hope that we dry up and blow away and you stay in jail. And we want to pledge that this is not going to happen. He said 100%. not to let them wear us out. We're not going right. to get not, Look, he's, they are not going to wear me out because I also have a plan, but we're going to continue attacking. Uh, I will talk to Danielle about that, and she'll, she'll spread it to you, Webster, and then we can give it to right. all your listeners so they'll know because we're not giving up, and we're not quitting this fight. We're going to continue to fight until we win. It's, you know, that's what I believe. But the, here's the key. I want you to always remember this. We need to let people know that we're dealing with a criminal enterprise. See, that word itself lets people know exactly what we're up against, and people need to know exactly what we're doing. Then, you know, in, in, in this pr- prison... I mean, nobody will believe the way it operates. Nobody will believe that, you know. You have one minute remaining. I got one minute left. Here's what I want to say. The bottom line is we are going to win. We are going to stop them. We are going to show them. And then I want everybody to go to bhbanko.org. bhbanko.org. And whatever you want to contribute, hey, we will be thankful for it. And, Webster, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, you, you know, you, you've been tremendous. You've been a full supporter, Danielle, the whole group. I just love you all. And, you know, and I'm not going to give up this fight. I'm going to continue fighting. I'm going to fight for these prisoners inside this place. And I'm going to find out how we can help them with the health care and, and, and the food service. We're going to show them that all around the world that this country is not what they say they, they are. So we're going to deal with it on that level. On that note, I'm going to have to say I will talk to you next year. Stay well, Reverend. Welcome back to uh, World Crisis Radio. That was uh, Reverend Edward Pinckney speaking from the Lakeland prison uh, of the state of Michigan in Coldwater, Michigan. Believe it or not, just the fact that he's there rather than in the frozen Siberia of Marquette on the southern shores of Lake Superior. That's already a little victory thanks to the agitation. Uh, of uh, friends of this uh, program and others uh, around the world. So we're still here, though, with with Daniela Walls, the chairwoman of the Tax Wall Street Party. Daniela, a couple of comments on Pinckney, and then I know you have some other... I just want to say, between us and the audience, I can't overstate how much I know Pinckney loves getting these letters. He appreciates it more than anything else. You can imagine, that's his lifeline. They mean everything to him. He reads them many times, and he responds. So please, just once again, if you could find that new address at bhbanko.com, dot org at freepinkney.wordpress.com, also at pink sorry pinkneycentral.weebly.com. The address is there. Copy it exactly as it's written there. You're going to have to have Edward Pinkney hashtag prisoner number 294671. I won't repeat the address because repeating it, you know, you could hear it wrong. It's there. Read it. It's the, it's the Coldwater, Michigan address. So, that's just that's I think that's mostly what I want to say this week that he really wants letters from you. And what we need to get into is this 47 traders, the dynamic with the Democrats and the Republicans. And I think we should jump into that. Like the Democrats and Republicans we know are both incompetent, but the way we want to do this is get to get the Republicans to become extinct first because otherwise we're going to have fascist fascist dictatorship if the government is only Republican meaning all branches you have a fascist dictatorship, and it won't work. Right now, you have these two psycho parties, but they cancel each other out. If the Democrats collapse, there will only be Republicans, and they will institute a permanent austerity dictatorship, and that's what our party fights against, the United Front Against Austerity and the Tax Wall Street Party. And the likes of this austerity dictatorship will, will be nothing that we any of us have seen yet. I mean, it's been bad for the last 30 years, you know, since the air traffic controllers and then my father being on strike with his airline and losing his job and the busting of the unions, it's been getting worse and worse. But if they get their way, hell on earth is coming and you'll never have a chance at politics after that. If the Republicans control the Supreme Court, Congress and presidency, it will be impossible for anybody to vote. They'll destroy all unions and organized resistance as they're doing right now. And then you'll have an absolute fascist dictatorship. So that's the summary of of why you always say, and we always say at the party, the Republicans must go first, then the Democrats need to split apart. I need to get this in, and I always want to do this every episode, and I never get to it, but I want to talk to the 
I want to talk to the libertarians for a moment now. If you are a libertarian, stop it. Repent. This Rand Paul betrays <laughs> you again and again. He's the guy who endorsed Mitt Romney. Ron Paul was the greatest earmark guy in the history of the House, etc. I mean, I could go down a the list. There's no need. They lie. They are not incorruptible. They are the most corrupt. They are the most duplicitous. And it's now time for you to dump them. The Austrians are the new Hessians in the sense that in the American Revolution, <laughs> much of the fight, I was thinking about that earlier, you know, that dynamic, but much of the fighting for the British crown was done by these Hessian mercenaries. Today, or Hessians, you sometimes hear Hessians. <laughs> Hessians. <laughs> Hessian mercenaries. <laughs> Sorry, Webster. Today, the Republicans are so hated and so weak that they needed to subcontract a lot of the dirty work to the Austrian school politicians like Rand Paul. Rand Paul was a provost provided, you know, ideological cover for austerity. And now everyone can see that he's just a traitor. Thank God that we have this. And it's, it's, it's trending. This isn't about, and what I want to say, it's like not about the libertarian leaders. I don't want to talk to them. They're unsalvageable. I encounter these guys. Well, look, look, before we get to this, let me just uh, get, get the context on this stuff, right? That, that, of course, little Rand Paul is a signatory to the 47 traders. And mm -hmm. he got his face on the front page of the New York Daily News, traitor. OK, but now we've got some of them are beginning to wake up. Right. All these people have been babbling that that uh, that the Pauls, the Paul faction, the Paul bearers were incorruptible. Justin Raimondo of antiwar dot com. Right. That's one of the leading libertarian antiwar publications, uh, websites, as the name suggests. He has now broken with little Rand and uh, and uh, condemned him. And he says, some people are willing to fight for ideas, but when the going gets tough, it's a far different story as far as Senator Paul is concerned. Mm -hmm. Faced with vicious attacks from the neoconservatives in the Republican Party, Senator Paul has become the libertarian Neville Chamberlain, meeting with Sheldon Adelson, right, the rabid uh, mm -hmm. pro-Israeli money bags, reversing his position on foreign aid to Israel, that's Paul, and doing everything short of asking Jennifer Rubin out on a date, right? She's a sometime columnist for the Washington Post. The cotton letter, 47 traders, is mm -hmm. Rand Paul's Munich, a betrayal mm -hmm. of his libertarian and anti-interventionist constituency that will not be soon forgotten. By joining the wrecking crew of Cotton and Company, Rand Paul has proven he cares more about gaining the support of neoconservatives, who will always hate him, than he does about preventing a major war in the Middle East. He lacks character. He has no sense of conviction. And that's the essence of leadership. So uh, goodbye, well, little Rand. Well, that's precisely why I brought this up today, because of this Raimundo article in that libertarian antiwar.com online magazine. Uh, it's a big anti-war website. You check out the article. And in the article, Raimundo says, this is the end of Ron, Rand Paul. He says, I'm never going to support him. I'm finished. I'm done. I've had it. Down with Rand Paul for signing the 47 traders. So finally, it seems the libertarians have their concrete reason as if they needed it. But, you know, they got it good to finally turn on Rand Paul. Um, and if you have spent the last time in the last time, I guess, in the last years being duped by Rand Paul, it's time to convert. I mean, that's what, that's <laughs> what I want to make. This Rand Paul, Ron Paul issue has been confusing people for long enough. The leaders of this anti-American Austrian school are unsalvageable. I was saying a second ago, I deal with these guys all the time, but the rank and file, you know, could repent, re-educate themselves and follow the right historical historically accurate path. The American system. The American, the American system. The American system is there for all to see, and it's the opposite of most of what what they say. My, my only fear is that the dogs will return to their vomit, right? Because this is, this is Rand Paul. He endorsed Romney. Romney was the biggest warmonger, uh, and he's done all these other things. So uh, I don't know. But well, maybe uh, they just don't know that there's an American... Uh, system because after 9-11 they were all led into this shadow netherland by these people thinking that that was the alternative to the mainstream republicans and they were anti-war because they were anti-interventionists and many of them got confused and i'm reaching out to those people okay let me ask you a question now uh if we look at austrianism and we look at Rand paul is this 
treachery rooted in the doctrine, or is it just a matter of the two individuals being corrupt? It's not a matter. We got two seconds. Oh, it's not a matter of the individuals. It's, a it's in the doctrine. It's the doctrine. They're libertines. They're going to. They're libertines, right? Well, how libertines. can they be loyal to anything when they're loyal to their own pleasure or whatever it is, right? Their own, their own id. It's the religion of the id. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now we have a special honor. And I hope we're welcoming someone that we'll uh, be able to call on as a very valuable resource in the weeks and months uh, to come. Uh, a lot of the uh, legal work in the uh, Pinkney case has uh, actually been uh, benefiting from the uh, excellent advice of Jeffrey Jackson and uh, Jeffrey Jackson Esquire. He's a lawyer operating out of Texas. He is a Texas foreclosure defense attorney who has been fighting the Wall Street banks as his day job, and he's been functioning as legal consultant to the tax Wall Street party. And I would just want to sum it up. I've heard him talk about the work he's done keeping people in their homes and defending them from these predatory and indeed illegal, outrageous uh, foreclosures. If you know that movie, uh, the wonderful It's a Wonderful Life, there's a scene... Uh, at one point where they need money for their bank and uh, the room is full of people. It's the lobby of a bank. And people uh, look at Jimmy Stewart, right? Jimmy Stewart being the, the head of the, uh, the sort of the people's banking operation. And they start saying, he saved my house. I wouldn't have a life if it hadn't been for him. And one of these days, there's going to be some kind of a testimonial dinner, which is going to be filled with people who are celebrating the work of Jeffrey Jackson his day job, keeping them in their homes. Uh, he's somebody who has saved the, the homes and, the, and the, uh, the families of a lot of people. And there's a tremendous amount of gratitude out there. And we share it because he's been helping, uh, again, with, the, uh, with these questions of Pinckney. So welcome to Jeffrey Jackson speaking to us from uh, Dallas? Houston. Houston, I'm sorry. Houston. Yes, Terrible thank mistake, you. But, but Houston. That's all right, Webster. Thank you very much. That's a very kind uh, introduction. Well, then, uh, we were, we were, uh, you're really the first uh, attorney, right? First actual lawyer that we've had on the program to talk about the, the prosecution against uh, Reverend Pinckney. If in the, the few minutes we have, maybe you just give us an overall legal impression from, a, from an experienced professional, why, why this prosecution is flawed and, uh, and wrong. Yes, yes. I've had the opportunity to review the motions on file in that case, particularly the, the post-trial motions, which get into all of the different reasons why the trial court should reverse that verdict that came down and either let Reverend Pinckney go free or at minimum give him a new trial. And there are several different reasons why the verdict, in my opinion, should be set aside and Reverend Pinckney either set free or this motion for new trial granted. The most egregious one, I would say, uh, would be the lack of evidence actually presented at that trial. Now, the transcript has not been made, and I have not read the, the, the transcript, obviously, but by all accounts from people who I have spoken with, including Reverend Pinckney, Reverend Pinckney's trial counsel, and others who sat in on the, on the trial, uh, the evidence offered was completely circumstantial. Essentially, the evidence in that trial was that Pinckney circulated petitions that have the appearance of some altered dates on just a few of those signatures. Two, that Reverend Pinckney had exclusive control, or never had exclusive control, excuse me, over the petitions with the altered dates at any given time that Pinckney was involved in submitting the petitions to the county clerk, and that Reverend Pinckney has actively exercised his rights to petition in the past. Now, the key to that is that there doesn't appear to have ever been a witness who testified that Reverend Pinckney altered dates, that they witnessed Reverend Pinckney alter dates. There was no video, for instance, that Reverend Pinckney uh, showed him altering any dates. There were no pictures uh, showing that Reverend Pinckney altered any dates. So essentially, the case relied upon 
the mere circumstance that he was leading the effort and that he possessed the petitions with the allegedly altered dates when he submitted them to the county clerk. And there is ample, ample support in jurisdictions uh, across the nation, including Michigan, that mere possession of a forged document is, in fact, no evidence that the possessor of that document actually forged it. And to, and to take it to the next level, possession of a forged document is no evidence that the possessor aided and abetted the forgery. So if it turns out that this is really all that the prosecution showed in this trial, it would, it would, in my mind, not rise to the level of beyond a reasonable doubt. And I have serious questions as to whether it would even rise to the level of probable cause to believe that Reverend Pinckney um, altered these dates. Um, other than the sufficiency of the evidence issue, I would go to what I would say would be the next most um, uh, 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 egregious, if you will, um, uh, tactic uh, brought here by this prosecutor, Sepik, and that is that they charged him with a felony instead of a misdemeanor. There is a rule of statutory interpretation called the rule of lenity. And this basically what this rule says is, if you have two criminal statutes that seem to proscribe or prohibit uh, the same conduct, and they both are vague enough uh, that they can be read to prohibit the same criminal conduct, that you have to charge the defendant with the lesser charge, with the statute that uh, proscribes the lesser penalty. And in this particular case, um, these two statutes, and the, the felony one being MCL 168.937, the misdemeanor one being 168.932C, uh, they, they both are vague, in my opinion, and they both proscribe the same criminal conduct, yet the prosecutor charged Reverend Pinckney under the felony. To add insult to injury, just a couple of months before Reverend Pinckney's trial, a case came out from the Michigan Court of Appeals called People v. Hall. And People v. Hall directly addressed this issue hmm. involving another defendant in another Michigan county who uh, had allegedly altered recall petitions. And they said, because the petition forms that are handed out in this case, handed out to Reverend Pinckney and his followers, because those forms have a warning that only mentions the misdemeanor uh, statute and not the felony statute, that you can only charge someone who is uh, accused of altering petition dates with the misdemeanor. Now, this People versus Hall case, uh, since it was so recent, and there is currently, it's currently being appealed to the Michigan Supreme Court. Unfortunately, it wasn't binding authority because it has not become a final decision. But it is incredibly on point and about the most persuasive authority that, that could be presented here that Reverend Pinckney should have been charged with a misdemeanor and not, and not a felony. Uh, but yet, despite the existence of this case on the books for two months before his trial, the prosecutor still insisted that he be charged as a felon. Uh, and I think I've run out of time, Webster. That, that I'm afraid so. Really I just want to, one point of information, though, is that these are forms that are printed by the local government jurisdiction. Am I right? Yes, that's absolutely right. Okay, the so... Their own form says it can only be a misdemeanor. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I want to point again, out, too, Jackson, if Houston. I could, April 14th at 9 a.m. is the hearing on the juror issue. April 14th. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's our uh, final segment. Remember, if you're hearing this, you may have, if you happen to be uh, in Brooklyn, you can... Uh, 
go over to the uh, protest against Whirlpool, the company town that's being held uh, in uh, Brooklyn. Check my Twitter feed for the uh, details. I've given them earlier in the program. Listen to it as it goes around again. Now, it's always interesting to get some slanders. And you know my um, my method is uh, a knot is a boost, as we say on Broadway, or as the Romans said, the ancient Romans, bona fama, mala fama, semper fama. Good fame, bad fame, it's all fame, and we're taking it. If I'm so inconsequential, why bother to attack me? Now, I have to mention that uh, some of the terpiloquium in uh, in question comes from uh, Abby Martin. She's interviewed on uh, the website of, I believe, her brother, Robbie Martin. This is called MediaRoots.org. Uh, the podcast is called R.I.P. Breaking the Set. I guess it means requiescat in uh, pace. Uh, and uh, this is an amazing thing because Abby Martin says... She approaches the question of the Crimea purely from the point of view of her own ratings and her own uh, her own uh, uh, gate receipts, I guess we could say, her own uh, reputation. Um, so she says, uh, "I was in a real bind on the Crimea," says Abby Martin. If I uh, if I if I went along with the uh, the Russian action, if I supported the Russian uh, repatriation of the Crimea, then uh, I would be viewed as a stooge of Putin, she says. And but if I if I was against it, then I would be uh, essentially bucking the, uh, the 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 wishes of the uh, the people running this uh, running this thing. So. Um, she's supposed to be a strong woman, so she says that she had to simply um, avoid the issue. Uh, I'm sorry. If you are given that kind of a podium, you've got to stand up for what is right, for the truth and for morality and for war avoidance. Right? These often converge. So uh, this is unacceptable to say, well, I, you, know, you have to sympathize with me because I'm a strong woman here, but at the same time I can't. I can't uh, face these issues on their own merit. Uh, and then she gets on to the fact saying uh, I, she didn't want to be total apologist for Putin. And she was then attacked by uh, a number of individuals, including Webster Tarpley, Paul Craig Roberts and Lou uh, Rockwell. Um, one one wag has pointed to the fact that uh, this podcast, you have to brace yourself because this is a torrent of vile language, obscenity, filth, profanity, scatology, you name it. Uh, one wag has said that uh, since um, Howard Stern is now uh, moving away from his current employers, that there might be an opening there for a, uh, a female contributor capable of having a really foul mouth. So that seems to be uh, one side of it. Uh, we've also got the Fondation Jean Jaurès. This I regret because I think uh, I have tried, uh, in, in especially my programs of last, uh, last June and July, I have tried to do justice to Jean Jaurès, uh, a great European, a great fighter for peace, somebody who tried very hard to prevent World War I for happening, from happening, right? If we had had a Caillot Jean Jaurès government in Paris in 1914, instead of this Viviani being run by Poincaré, we might have uh, escaped with fewer disasters in the 20th century. But uh, they, uh, they now are writing about... Uh, the question of conspiracy theory. They insist on calling me a conspiracy theorist. I think this is not accurate. If you note what I do, I have a program. I have an organizing perspective. I'm trying to build an organization. I have a strategy. Uh, and this is not, uh, this is absolutely not the same as the various paranoid libertarian uh, websites that are so easy to find. Anyway, a research note of the Fondation Jean Jaurès, and of course this was a socialist party leader who was assassinated a couple of days before France declared war in World War I. Uh, 
uh, we're told the conspiracy intellectuals are North Americans. Particular mention is made of Webster Tarpley, and then there's a list of others. Um, along with their European counterparts, they form a kind of international, the Conspiracy International, to which Thierry, Thierry Maison, president of the Voltaire Network, tried to give a concrete form in November 2005 in Brussels, bringing together an anti-imperialist conference, Axis for Peace, uh, which is a who's who of conspiracy authors. Well, again, as a historian, I'm not out to find conspiracies. What I'm trying to do is find out what actually happened. As um, you know, various historians have said, the task of history is to describe uh, was eigentlich geschah, what actually happened, wie es eigentlich gewesen ist, what actually happened there. Um, and it's not the question of conspiracy. The problem is when you're dealing with oligarchical social formations, such as the U.S. today, the characteristic method of oligarchical operation is through pre-concert, as Abraham Lincoln called it. Remember that by their, the measure of these characters from Jean Jaurès, and I've, I, you can read about this in my uh, book, 9-11 Synthetic Terror Made in USA, go back to Bernard Balin's book on the ideology of the American Revolution, and you will see that the central element is the idea that there was a continuing social effort, conspiracy if you want, uh, that meant that uh, the uh, British oligarchy was determined to wipe out the liberties of the North American colonies. This can be traced back to Edmund Burke, of all people, that a lot of left liberals even uh, and conservatives and all kinds of people would, would embrace today. But then if you then go back to uh, John Adams, go back to George Washington, go back to um, any number of others, look, go back to the Declaration of Independence, and you will see that the Jeffersonian text of the, of the U.S. Declaration of Independence adumbrates what? A conspiracy theory. He has, he has, he has, and when this train of abuse is pursued through many governments by different people, when you add that up, you have to conclude that there is a, uh, a deep institutional commitment. And remember also that Lincoln's House Divided speech essentially says when you see people like Franklin Pierce, when you see uh, people like Stephen Douglas and Roger Taney, Taney of the Supreme Court, and others, when you see them bring the component parts of a structure together and somehow it all meshes and matches and fits together, well, then you have to conclude pre-concert. Pre-concert is the term used by uh, Lincoln. There's also the question of the Polk, James Knox Polk, and his intrigue to start the Mexican War, right, which is also done at the level of such pre-concert. So uh, I reject this notion of conspiracy theorist. There may be some on their list who do qualify as conspiracy theorists. If you don't have a program, if you don't have an organizing perspective, if you're not doing anything organizationally, well, then maybe, maybe that, uh, that shoe might fit. But uh, in my case, uh, no. Uh, so um, that's our program. For today, World Crisis Radio for the 13th of March, and uh, we'll see you next week. Don't forget to write a letter of a letter to Reverend Pinckney and uh, join us in the fighting against the 47 tyrants, traitors, and impeach Scalia. And don't forget, arrest McCain for ISIS, also relevant. Back in one week.